Hi, and uh, welcome to the cinema of the DFF, the German Film Museum and Film Institute, or Film Institute and Film Museum, however you prefer. Um, I welcome you all to yet another uh, edition of our lecture and film uh, series here, dedicated to Chantal Ackermann. I'm very, very happy that so many of you came. Um, I do have a couple of announcements to make uh, before we start with tonight's event. Um, because this month will be full of events, so I hope to see many of you uh, in the cinema during this month um, for all the activities we have planned. To start with, we have uh, three lectures, so tonight we have Lalif Melamed with us, and next week we're going to have Eva Kuhn coming from Lunenburg, presenting Jean Dillman, one of the most uh, expected films here from the series, and I would like to... Um, warn you that next week the lecture will start at 6 because due to the length of the film if we started at 8.15 as we usually do we would be here throughout the night so um, I remind you that next week we start at 6 o'clock with the lecture. And then um, the day after, so the 14th of June, we are going to have Eric de Kuiper back here in Frankfurt. For those of you who saw his lecture here in November, uh, when he presented La Captive from Chantal Ackermann, we, um, he was a longtime partner, um, collaborator of um, Ackermann in the script, for example, of La Captive. He will be presenting his uh, newest film, My Life as an Actor, uh, on the 14th of June here in the cinema at 6 o'clock. Um, then, uh, also kind of uh, in the context of the Chantal Ackermann uh, lecture series, we have this month a whole series dedicated to Delphine Sehik. I mean, we're going to see her next week in Jeanne Dillman. We have already seen her here in this series in the uh, Golden 80s, in uh, Letters Home, for those of you who came to the accompanying programming as well. So we're going to have the chance to explore more of the work of this amazing actress, and not only as an actress, but also as an activist and videomaker. Um, we decided to make a, a, mix, a mix program, not only with her works as an actress, but also as um, a director. And so we're going to screen um, some of those films, including the newest documentary about her work as a video activist and feminist in the 70s in France, together with um, um, Carole Rousseaupoulos, uh, Delphine Carol in Somuse, this documentary that premiered at the Berlinale this year. We're going to be screening for the first time in Frankfurt here in June. So I warmly welcome you all to um, grab a copy of our program for June if you, don't, if you haven't yet and to check out our website dff.film.film. Um, you can also, in case you don't know yet, you can already buy um, tickets for these programs for our cinema online. We have started this week uh, with a online ticketing, so if you don't have the time to uh, call to reserve or to come here earlier, you can already buy the tickets directly online and print it at home um, or bring it on your smartphone. That's our new system starting this uh, month as well. So. Now that I have given all the uh, news and information that you need to have for the rest of the month, I would like to welcome very warmly Professor Vincent Rediger, who will present tonight's guest, so we can start off with the event for tonight. Thank you. Yes, good evening also uh, from my side. Uh, there are several threads that weave through the series as they weave through Chantal Ackermann's uh, work. Uh, last week, um, we uh, last two weeks ago, Alisa LeBeau um, introduced us to Letters from Home, which uh, is part of, of an ongoing engagement of Chantal Ackermann with the figure of her mother, who appears in several of her films and uh, is actually the topic of some of her films and uh, the internal uh, the, or, or the topic of her very last film who will also be the, con the, the final film of this program and then other thread that runs through her work is the one that with a quote that I um, already cited uh, two weeks ago from Babette Mongold we could describe as Chantal Ackermann's strong interest in where she came from and uh, that interest covers not only her family history, but uh, her Jewish heritage, uh, more generally speaking. Um, Dest, the film that um, Claire Atherton introduced us to last uh, fall, uh, could be seen as an exploration of uh, Central Europe in the early 1990s, but it's also an exploration of spaces that were distinctly marked by 
uh, Jewish culture throughout the 19th and 20th century. And tonight's film um, could also be uh, classified under that rubric. It's a film uh, entitled Laban, uh, Down There, uh, which refers to Israel and which is about an other exploration of uh, what you might call the spaces of Ackermann's Jewish heritage. The big question is, of course, that the film raises is why does she travel to Tel Aviv and never actually leave the room? Uh, because that's what we're going to see in the film. And uh, luckily for us, we have someone who knows the city very well and knows Ackermann's work very well and is very well positioned to uh, answer that question and to uh, uh, introduce us to that film. Uh, Lalif Melamed um, is a festival curator, but most importantly, a film scholar with a specialization in documentary film. She earned her BA and MA degrees uh, in film studies from the University of Tel Aviv and then moved on to the United States where she earned her PhD from New York University with a dissertation on uh, memorial private videos of Israeli families commemor commemorating their um, uh, fallen sons. Uh, an interesting and in a way weird um, home movie genre that has become part of a public uh, commemoration ritual in, in Israel. That work, that dissertation, by the way, won the very prestigious uh, uh, Katrin Singer Kovacs dissertation award of the Society of Cinema Media Studies in 2017 and uh, is going to be published as a book um, sometime next year or the year after that. Um, well, these things take a little time. Um, and right now, uh, Lalif Milamed uh, is actually working here in Frankfurt. She has been a postdoc in our graduate and colleague configurations of film since uh, 2017. Uh, we were very lucky and we are proud that we were, we were able to lure her away from uh, Israel and to bring her here uh, to work in our graduate and colleague as a postdoc. As I already said, Lalif Melamed is also a festival curator. She's a curator for the Doka Aviv um, uh, documentary film festival in Tel Aviv. And um, uh, she is someone who manages to combine uh, festival work, curatorial work, with uh, scholarship at the very highest level. So please welcome together with me, Lalif Milamed. Hi, and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, as um, uh, Vincent's already mentioned in his in introduction, there is um, uh, definitely for me a personal side to this lecture, um, and maybe I'll touch upon it uh, during my talk. But I want to start with a citation from the film. If I would have been born here, my mother would let me play in the street with... Sorry? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Is that good? Yeah. Sorry. So I'm starting with a, with a citation from the film. If, he w if I would have been born here, my mother would have let me play out in the street with the other children. In Brussels, she wouldn't let me. She was afraid. Here, she would have let me and I wouldn't spend hours looking out of the window at the other children playing with a ball or something else. Looking out the window, I get all up inside myself. Here, I would have run. I would have screamed. Here, a child is a king, like in America. Now I'm in the habit of looking outside the window. I look and I get all up inside myself. This is uh, one of the last monologues in Laba, um, a film Ackerman shot from an apartment window in Tel Aviv in the spring of 2003. But I want to start my introduction to this film uh, with an expert from a later film, Ackerman's No Home Movie, which was also her last film. <coughs> After the film was completed and shortly after it was screened in New York, a place that is so-called home for Ackerman, Ackerman committed suicide in her, in her Paris apartment. Um, and can we see the first clip, please? 
No Home Movie features a series of conversations between Ackerman and her aging mother Nellie. Like Laba, it was shot by Ackerman herself. It's a film about the mother dying, as Brenda Longfellow described it, and Eliza Lebo referred to um, Longfellow's beautiful analysis of the film um, two weeks ago. It is a last love letter to the mother from a director whose every film was in a way a love letter to her mother. What we saw is its first few shots. I was struck by the opening sequence, a long take fixated on a desert view, a tree straggling in the wind that trembles in our ears, and then a cut to a green urban serenity, and then to a view from a window, which I'm not sure we actually were able to see here. Um, the desert setting looks very familiar to me. Is this the Israeli Negev? Ugly, dry, gray, hostile. The green uh, setting is certainly Brussels. Here and there, no home movie, as the film title tells us. No home movie is a film about a terrible loss, the loss of a mother, of a symbolic place in the world, the loss of a home. In a way, so does Laba, which Ackerman meditates on the condition of being removed, lost, homeless, in a place meant to be hospitable and homely. In the first diary-like entry we hear in Laba, Arkaman talks about suicide. The suicide of her beloved and disturbed aunt Ruth, who was never the same, as she tells us, after she came back from the camps, and the suicide of the mother of the famous Israeli author Amos Oz. The film opens with a number of long takes um, that feature peoples on rooftop terrace in the building across the street that are busy in random tasks an everyday ritual over there, out there. Only after a few long minutes, Ackerman offers these associative thoughts about suicide. Looking outside the window, removed from life down there, suicide comes up as a final decisive act to end life in an unhospitable world. And later in the film, Ackerman uh, wonders in the ears of um, one of her hosts uh, whether or not Amos Oz's uh, mother committed a suicide because she felt um, uh, out of place, she, because she felt in exile in Israel. Um, I want to be clear. I don't want to make any assumptions on why Ackerman chose to end her own life. I don't find it valuable and I think it would be gossipy of me. But I want to think about suicide in relation to the feeling of homelessness. Both Ackerman's aunt and O's mother jumped from the terrace. Their sons became well-known writers, one in Tel Aviv, one in Brussels. Maybe they too spent their entire career writing love letters to the mothers they lost. Ackerman, as she says it herself later in the film, feels that she doesn't belong, feels floating or sinking, feels removed. In Israel, she says, she, she thought, I will belong, but this is also only a mirage. Something in me is damaged. Laba is made of a series of long still takes, mostly taken from an apartment window where nothing happens. People framed by buildings and windows, distant figures, are busy in performing a mundane routine. Ackerman's camera is still, staring for long minutes. The window marks a clear threshold, in and out, here and there. It is often covered with blinds, a semi-transparent divide that masks the observers, separate her or him from the street. The window, the layered blinds, the camera itself, makes the view look like a surface, impenetrable, flat, untouched by what is out there, life themselves. While Ackerman camera gazes at the street, the sound often marks an inside, an ambient of domestic noises, making tea or typing on a computer, brushing her teeth, and the more invasive sound of the phone, family and friends who call to see how Ackerman is doing, often asking her out, a hospitable invitation. Ackerman politely rejects these gestures and stick to her contemplative solitude. For those of you who were following the series um, um, throughout all the lectures, it was mentioned how Ackerman's work uh, was affected by the avant-garde. Um, her, her fixation on the view from the window is a possession of pure observation. A certain point, 
sorry, at a certain point, people, places, and objects become abstract motions, producing a cinematic poetics of movement and light, and this is definitely an avant-garde um, poetics. There is an alienation in this view from the window, but also the beauty and lure of abstraction and sensation. The observer does not belong. They are not consumed by a place, its people, its history, its stories, and its past. Ackerman makes Laba in 2003 during a period of few months she spent at Tel Aviv University when she was invited to teach a semester in the film department. <clears throat> sorry, in the film department. A daughter of a Jewish family of Holocaust survivors, Ackerman used to visit Israel with her family as a child. For the exilic Jew, for the survivor, Israel presented itself as a potential home, a promised rescue, a shelter where Jews are always welcome. Cassevier Carnot, who worked with Ackerman as a producer, suggested that while staying in Israel, she will make a film. There was a lot to say about Israel in the time. These were particularly difficult years. Ackerman didn't want to make a film. It was too complicated and too personal for her. Upon her visit to Israel, Ackerman stays at home, as I said. She barely leaves the apartment, cloister herself from both hostility and hospitability, looking from the window onto down there, a place that is at that time torn by war and violence. But the apartment in which she stays is not her own. In this apartment, too, she is a guest. The apartment belongs to a distant friend, and Ackerman preoccupies herself with how to make sure she leaves everything in place upon her departure. In this place that is meant to be her refuge, the apartment, or the place that is meant to be her eternal utopian habitat, Israel, she feels lost, unable to articulate or place herself and her feelings. She collects her thoughts in the form of notes for a potential film about Israel, in a blue and white notebook, and I wonder about the color scheme, is this a coincidence? But when she travels to Spain to meet her niece, finally leaving the apartment, she loses the notebook when the two go out to watch a film. I lost the notebook at the movies, she says, or in the fast food place we went to before the movies. A film lost to film, or to fast food. Ackerman admits that she was too lazy to even go back and search for it. The attempt to say something in a film about Israel, to negotiate hospitality and hostility, the need to love it or to feel at home in it versus its alienating and aggressive reality, has an estranging effect. Ackerman gives up, lets the notes to be lost in the movies, and stick to the position of an onlooker, an outsider, a guest. Ackerman's apartment is located in the west part of the city a few minutes from the beach, very close to the market and to the city center. Today it would have made a perfect Airbnb apartment for the many tourists who want to taste the city vivid life. This is where you would, you would like to stay if you want to fill the city. But Ackerman stays at home. This is very personal articulation of a home, not home. And when I told Elisa Lebeau um, that was here two weeks ago that I'm going to um, talk about Labas. She told me that uh, for her the film was too personal to talk about. Um, indeed, it is very personal for me as well. I sympathize with Ackerman's sense of a strangeness and the feeling that Israel is a place that seems to spit out its dwellers. But the sunburned images of Tel Avivian rooftop terrace, the blades that keep slicing and splitting the frame but also protect, the beach, the constant background noise of construction work, the slightly diagonal leaning of Yana Hanavi Street, where she, where she stays, um, towards the beach, a leaning, a leaning sometimes visible in the outlines of the building's Ackerman frames, all these store a very intimate knowledge for me. I moved to the city a little bit before Ackerman came there as a visitor. In 2003, I started my studies in the film department of Tel Aviv University. I didn't take Ackerman seminar. I was too uh, busy trying to figure out my core classes, and I didn't even know she was there. Um, it wasn't the city's prettiest hour, to say the least. After the early 90s brought with them hopes for ending the regional conflict, everything crumbled with the assassination of the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 1995, 
the right-wing government that was established in the following elections, and the breaking of the Second Intifada in 2001. Late 1990s and early 2000 witnessed an escalation of violence that further destabilized regional politics and deepened the schism within Israeli society. Violence leaked outside the occupied territories and into the Jewish Israeli streets in the form of recent of recurrent suicide attacks. Inside Israel, the streets were no longer safe. I reminder that out there, outside in the occupied territories, it hasn't been safe for quite a while. While being shaken by the raging violence in the street, Israeli society and mainly Israeli left was being confronted with hostility and destruction and faced a massive ideological crisis. The country's urban cultural center, Tel Aviv, a haven of good life, was affected by it as well. Um, now, there is a long tension between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, so I should say Jerusalem is also a cultural urban center. Um, I guess that there isn't any Jerusalemite in the audience, because otherwise, yeah. Um, but the city uh, was always, um, the city of Jerusalem was always torn uh, by conflict. Um, I do need to say that the, these uh, waves of massive suicide attacks um, hardly affect, uh, harshly affected the city, and I think it's only now starting to recover from um, this period in the early 2000s. Um, People felt they might meet their death abruptly, unexplainedly, while taking the bus, going to the mall, sitting in cafes. You were always alert, vulnerable, anxious. While locals still hang on to their love for sitting outside and hanging outside until the very late hours of the night, there were no tourists, shops and restaurants were closing down, the hotels were deserted, the streets suffered from a sort of negligence and emptiness. The moral was low. During Ackerman's stay in Tel Aviv, one of these suicide bomb attacks takes place in a bar called Mike's Place. Um, this place is situated on the promenade, very close to Ackerman's apartment. Ackerman is asleep when the bombing occurs, but she, but she feels dis disintegrated and shaken by it. Another suicide. Maybe the suicide bomber, too, felt he was deprived of his home. So after developing rather loosely these two positions in Ackerman Laba, here and there, staying at home and being a guest, I want to think about them as a position in relation to the Israeli reality. So I want to show you the um, opening shots of Diary, um, a six-volume documentary masterpiece by one of the most important Israeli um, documentary filmmakers, David Perlov. Like Ackerman's, Perlov's work is tightly linked with the avant-garde. Perlov was born in Brazil to a Jewish family. In his 20s, um, he moves to Paris to study architecture, but is drawn to cinema. He works with the late, late documentarian Yori Sivans and then moved to Israel. His diary series is shot over more than two decades, and he starts shooting it in 1973, uh, while positioning his camera in front of um, his apartment window. Uh, that is situated next to even Gvirol, close to the municipality plaza. So more or less 15 minutes walk from where Ackerman is staying. Um, let's see the beginning of it. I want to film for myself and by myself. This is how Perlov explains his decision to entrench in his domestic setting. Perlov at the time had a series of films produced with the Israeli National Film Service being the main or actually only means of documentary production in Israel at the time, in the 1970s and also the 60s, the National Film Service was actually very accommodating towards experimental film language and the avant-garde. But Perlov's professional relationship with the service um, when he started shooting seemed to have reached an end. Perlov's last film was censored and he doesn't get any new commissions. He is excluded. Perlov's heavily accented baritone voice, and I can't explain to you how mournful I am that I couldn't show you the Hebrew version, because his voice became so distinct and I heard so many wonderful impersonating of this voice. 
Um, so in Hebrew, you hear more of the um, heavy accent. Um, it already marks him as um, a stranger within. Alienated by his professional environment, he withdraws to himself. Instead of making a state commissioned record, he is drawn to everyday domestic rhythms, to his intimate environment. But reality trickles inside the house. Once again, these are very dramatic days. Perlow starts shooting in the fall of 1973. Well, he shoots people heading for, Yom Kippur, for the Yom Kippur prayer in the synagogue across the street, the sound of alarm announcing the break of the Yom Kippur war, one, if not the most dramatic war in Israeli history, is sound. From his window and from the TV screen, reality keeps penetrating his home. Yet the view from the window makes it all look mundane, maybe even normal. Historical dramas imbricated into everyday affairs and banal family life. <coughs> like Perlov, filmmaker Michal Aviad withdraws into her home. In her 2002 film For My Children, a distinct product of the political climate of the 2001 Intifada and the years of recurrent suicide attacks on Israeli cities, she turns her filmmaker's gaze inside. Most of the film is shot by Aviad with her domestic TV camera. Um, the film is, uh, for most of its part, an everyday record of Aviad's household. Her night conversations with her husband about their decision to live a comfortable life in San Francisco, in which they lived close to a decade after moving to it as young students, and to raise their family in Israel. Aviad tries to place herself in a larger narrative. She interviews her parents and her husband's parents, all of them European Jews who were forced to flee their home in the, during the Nazi occupation, and imbricates homemade and state archival materials in the interviews. This probing into what brought Aviad and her family to live in this place, and what future does this place hold for, for her children, are framed by the daily ritual of sending her children to school from her Tel Avivian terrace, located very close to Perlov's, slightly northeast from Ackermann's, she anxiously accompanies her children with her, with her camera until they disappear from sight. Aviad is afraid. The kids are not allowed to take the bus, and the parents try to think how to limit um, um, their time outside. And also throughout uh, Aviad film, we constantly see um, the, television, the television frame that brings into the house uh, news about uh, more suicide attacks. Writing about um, post-Second Intifada Israeli documentaries, film scholar Shmulik Duvdevani notes that many of them are preoccupied with the filmmaker's first-person perspective. Often these filmmakers turn their camera inside, into their own family affairs and into their homes. According to Duvdevani, this stemmed from a guilt complex, a need of the, of the Israeli documentary community, most of its members um, associated with the Israeli left, to self-reflect about their own positioning in relation to the violence out there. Is removing oneself a proper response? Filmmaker Avi Mugrabi often interlaces in his films long scenes in which he, in the role of filmmaker Avi Mugrabi, sits in his living room and shares with his spectators his dilemmas and hesitations on how to engage with his subjects, how to position himself in relation to the hostile reality materials. And, and unfortunately, I won't show you a clip from this film, which is absolutely brilliant, uh, but I'll talk about it. I say that Mugrabi plays oneself as his self-reflection in front of the camera in his Tel Avivian living room, very close to Abima Square, one kilometer to the east from Ackerman, are ironic. They're self-indulged, somehow sarcastic, about the left's puzzlement and inarticulation in relation to the complicated reality. These slides that I'm showing you are from a rather later film, Z32, in which Mugrabi portrays an ex-soldier who is trying to come to terms with a crime he committed while serving in the occupied territories. 
in between, we see Mugrabi sitting in his living room and in a sort of a Brechtian gesture confesses about his hesitation in the form of a song. Tammy, Mugrabi's wife, accuses him for providing a form of excuse for the soldier. She says that the film serves as a mean of ex exoneration, of pardon. She tells Mugrabi he can do whatever he wants with his film, but she doesn't want him to bring the murderer into their home. So once again, we have this notion of removal. This alleged speechlessness or, or inability to encounter the harsh reality on the side of Israeli filmmakers, their decision to stay removed at home, is echoed by a parallel ambivalence expressed by exilic Jewish intellectuals and filmmakers from Ackerman's generation, so um, second generation to Holocaust survivors. Them too are struggling to reconcile with the loss of a promised home of a sort not the one that failed to materialize, but the one imagined. In times, it seems that to lose a promise of a home or to visit that home and still feel estranged is even more excruciating than leaving the place you called home. Ohad Lanzmann writes about a series of cinema tours, not just Jewish, but most of them are, who made a film about their visit to Israel. These films revolve around an encounter with an imagined land. Chris Marker, Pierre Paolo Pasolini, Claude Lanzmann, Susan Zontag, and Ackerman all made films that are trying to negotiate a utopian imagination of Marxist socialist dreams materialized in the new country. A country resurrected as a mark of historical justice, a refuge for, for a prosecuted people. Was the collapse of utopia into scary dystopian ghosts, a, per a perpetual primal colonial crime already quite visible in Israel of the 70s. Um, Landsman is maybe the most positivist visitor, warmly adopting the energies of the new nation, making a trilogy of films that together adopt the Israeli national narrative. In Perkwa Israel, also called Varum Israel, Shoah and Tzahal, three films that Landsman uh, made um, from the early 70s and until the late 80s. Landsman um, reconstructs the Israeli myth of moving from destruction to salvation and resurrection. There is death and, <clears throat> there is death and sacrifice and heroism. Susan Zontag, um, sorry. Um, it is important to note that Landsman starts this love affair with Israel when he visits the country after the 1967 victory, indeed a moment of euphoria. Susan Zontak, on the other hand, visits Israel right after the 1973 war. Her film, The Promised Land, um, that um, these slides that we saw are taken from it, portrays a country that is still licking its wounds after a horrifying war, barely getting back on its feet. As her film's title suggests, for Zontag, this is the crushing of the Jewish dream of a Jewish promised land. In 2003, the same year that Ackerman is shooting Laba, Lin Zaks, a Jewish-American experimental filmmaker, reads in the newspaper about an Israeli woman filmmaker from Kibbutz Netzer, near Janine, who was shot dead with her children by an armed Palestinian who broke into her house at night. Zach sees herself in the woman. She wants to know more, but doesn't want to go and visit. I'm not a war photographer, she explains. She contacts a former student of hers, an Israeli who recently left New York and, go and went back to Israel, and asked him to help her get a hold of the footage of the dead filmmaker. Zax herself follows the story and tries to put together the pieces by newspaper articles, television news, and filled, ma and filled materials sent to her by her student. The film is titled States of Unbelonging. As Zax herself once told me, I made it precisely because I didn't want to go there. This last shot, the one that you see here, um, is taking on the beach in Tel Aviv, um, a little south to where Ackerman is staying. A place Sachs did not see, only as an image. 
For her, Tel Aviv and Janin are on the same sequence or in the same frame, perhaps as they should be, both tangled and tied in an impetus of destruction. For her, this is no longer, or perhaps never was, a home movie. Thank you. So uh, thank you for, for this wonderful introduction, which was actually the introduction to several films. Uh, we were just saying that uh, uh, a few of us would have loved to watch every single one of them. And uh, it was actually a perspective for a whole program uh, that you uh, presented us. And of course, also an introduction uh, to this film. One of the images that you showed us um, from... Uh, um, the diary. Was, yeah, the diary film uh, stuck with me, which was the the balcony with the two empty chairs, and and in a way, this film is a film about balconies too, and it's it's just such an inspired choice that the final image is of two people like connecting the two balconies. It's like the first time you see them communicate with each other, and it's also certainly then, but you probably you realize it earlier too, um, that um, Chantal Ackermann, of course, never goes out on her balcony. Uh, but she watches people on balconies. And the balcony is a really interesting sort of transitory space that underlines the whole argument you were making about inside and outside and being there and not being there. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe you can say something about yeah. balconies. I mean, the balconies and blinds. Um, yeah. But it's really interesting because balconies take an important part of the um, history of the city architecture. So it's a very warm city, and um, uh, when when they built it in um, um, the early uh, 20th century, most of the houses were built with like big terraces, and because um, w with the thought that people would spend most of the time during the summer month, which is what like eight months of the year, uh, would spend them outside on the balconies. Um, so the balconies were like a really, as you said, a transit and, tra and transitory space. So it was in between the public and private because you know it was part of your home, but you were also outside. Um, interestingly, though, later on, the, um, the balconies, I mean, the houses became too small, so people started closing the balconies with blinds. Um, they didn't do it with walls because you had to get a special permission from the city and it was really expensive, so they, you know, the blind was kind of like an in-between solution. Um, so it's, it's a very important part of, of, um, of, the, of the social culture in a way. Um, I mean, people communicate or you know, are forced to communicate with their neighbors this way. And uh, there is an entire tradition about balconies. Um, so, but, but Ackerman shies away from it, you know, she stay locked right. uh, behind the blinds. Yeah, so she doesn't even engage in that, in that kind of transitory neighborly uh, uh, communication. Um, can you elaborate maybe a bit more on the, on the motive of the suicide relative to the space? I mean, this is something that, that you discussed very prominently, but... Yeah, I mean, for me it was striking that you look at all these terraces and talk about suicide because it's very tempting. But then there is the question of, you know, at the very end, the down there is to go to Palestine, which is a suicidal act. But actually, I mean, I think Ackerman keep repeats uh, about the suicide and about this question because, I mean, at the end, she was like, maybe our life would look different. Maybe all of us who were, were okay, we would have recovered from what happened to us if we would have gone uh, to... Yeah, if we would have gone down there. Um, so for me, it was a question, what is happening down there? So down there is, you know, the you can jump. You know, or down there you can save yourself. Um, and, and once again, you know, I, I, I think about the suicide. On, I mean, the suicide itself, was, as I said, is, is, an, is an act of agency in a way. It's doing something uh, rather than kind of like, you know, looking on things from the inside. Um, but also but also it's it's submit yourself to being lost. It's it's this kind of like final statement of there is no home. 
yeah, and and sort of solving the problem of of uh, on homelessness in 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 that sense in an act. Yeah, it it became really interesting to me when, you know, um, when all of a sudden I realized that the suicide bomber bombers is yet another uh, act of suicide, mm. and and I mean. I did some work on, on, on a film by a Palestinian filmmaker called Paradise Now, uh, which is about two suicide bombers or, who are on their way to commit an attack in Tel Aviv. And uh, they dress them up as Israelis, uh, which means that they um, ask them to wear suits. It's it's a strange thing. So instead of kind of like, I mean, the, the rationale behind it is that if they'll wear suits, they'll assimilate in the space. But they're not because no one wears a suit in, in like the Israeli summer. And things go wrong and these two guys walk around and they're constantly marked in space because they wear suits. So even within their own village, like people keep running into them while they're carrying the, the, the explosive on them and ask them, are you on your way to a wedding? Why do you wear suits? And so I started thinking about uh, um, about the suicide as a way that is in, kind of like you assimilate in space, you are being consumed by space, um, and 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 that that's also the trick with the suicide bombers, right? They need to enter a space and assimilate in it in order for the suicide to be more effective. Um, now, when you kind of like bring this rationale to think about uh, these two women that felt excluded from space, that didn't find a home, and then committed. Um, suicide in order in a way to assimilate I mean right. that's that's very jarring for me yes and uh, I mean in a way this is also the, the argument that um, Ackerman is making in her conversation with Amos Oz and then it's interesting how she says he hesitated and then he, and then he said maybe maybe that's precisely it yes do we have questions from the audience comments observations yes please Thank you for your lecture. Um, could we by any chance get a list of the films you mentioned or at least the filmmakers because I belong to those people who really want to see all the films right now. Uh, let's talk to Laura about it. <laughs> I mean, I would be happy um, um, to spread the word because, I mean, as I said, these are all films that I, I really like. Um, um, the, the first one is a series of, I think, around six films called Diary by David Perlov. Um, and um, the second one was For My Children by Michal Aviad. Uh, and the last one was Z32 by Avi Mugrabi. Um, and, and they're all fantastic filmmakers. Um, very prominent in Israel. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, I bring these as an example, my favorite ones, but uh, uh, for a very massive trend of um, Israeli filmmakers who, um, I mean, I, I put Perlov aside because he's a unique and also like a historical landmark um, in Israeli documentary. But um, these are like series of filmmakers that in late 90s till first decade of the, of the 2000s, um, make films about themselves. They 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 stop looking outside and what's happening and start looking inside. And and this, I mean, as I said, Devani mentioned it as a, some kind of a guilt complex. I'm I'm I like his argument, but also I think it's more than that. Um, and it's also in a way looking away from what is happening. That I mean, they it's very hard for them to find something to say. Um, so it's really interesting how you know the Israeli documentary cinema in this decade is really happening. I mean, it's you know reality. Outside. It's so fascinating and conflicted, but the, the the films are really looking into domestic settings. If I can um, offer to write down the names in case you were wondering. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's what I was going to say. The talks recording is going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel of the mm -hmm. Film Museum, so you can look up the uh, Film Museum on YouTube, um, and we can write in the comments below or like in the description of the video if you want to write. We, we can upload a PDF um, on the on, or on the, the website of the series. The yes. The Avi Mograbi film Set 32 is on our 
at the university on our list of 435 films that our bachelor students have to have seen before they go to their final exam. Um, <coughs> so I told this to Avi, by the way. <laughs> you did? Okay. <laughs> so it's on there, and if you're connected to a student, you can have access to it. Or if you ask a professor. Um, so that one we have, and the other ones we're buying. Um, Lolif already promised that she'll bring them back from Israel when she goes back there the next time. Yeah. Any other questions or comments on the film? Yes, please. Oh, I heard that uh, someone asked me if if I know. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and I said that, oh, no, I know a lot about her family. Uh, yeah, and I, I heard that she's. Um, I mean, Perlov is a fascinating uh, filmmaker. Also, his early films for the National Film Service of Israel. I mean, I know it always sound like you know a uh, film commissioned by the state would be boring and propaganda like but he made fantastic films uh, also when they were commissioned um, yeah i heard that she's in town <laughs> so for those of she's you who haven't heard the the granddaughter of david perloff is a student at the state of mm. yeah. it's really yeah. interesting how these films are being rediscovered and rediscovered and rediscovered again and again yeah. Uh, and they were never like an internal like Israeli thing because actually they were eventually they were commissioned by the British Channel Four. This is why there is an English version. Uh, but I think that in the new DVD set they actually released the Hebrew version with subtitles, which, as I said, the to hear the Hebrew voiceover is uh, really special. Um, so yeah. Yes, please. Um, I missed the talk, so I don't know if you mentioned it, but um, I had this association with this book, La Bar, uh, by Karl Jury Huysman, and it uh, rendered the um, this film for me uh, kind of very bleak, because it is a very bleak book. Um, do we know if this is a conscious allusion to the book, or is it... Um, uh, Maybe just uh, coincidence, yeah. I don't know. I didn't mention it in the talk. Um, and I didn't see that Ackerman herself is mentioning it. Um, not that it means anything. I mean, I don't read films only according to what their authors say. But, I mean, she doesn't mention the book as an influence for her. Okay, thank you. But, I mean, it's quite possible that she, she had read the book and... I mean, she, uh, as we know, she's a very literary filmmaker, and she's extremely well read. Uh, and actually, as as you know, uh, in 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 her collaboration with Eric de Kauper, sometimes it was her who tr had to convince him to read novels uh, and uh, uh, actually get interested in in certain types of novels. That's actually, her who introduced him, who was much her senior, or slightly her senior, to Proust. Um, and if she read Proust, it's clear that she read Uri's Call Hausmann's as well. Um, so it's possible, but but I don't see a direct reference either. Um, but I was I was uh, curious about the, the writing process here. Uh, I mean, f if, if you look at the film and, and try to figure out how it came about and how it was made, it's clear that uh, she... She must have had a lot more footage, um, and I'm guessing her and Claire Atherton spent a lot of time going through the footage and selecting it. And I was wondering at what time that specific form of the film took shape. And uh, I mean, the sound recordings are obviously original sound recordings, and uh, we must assume that usually they are actually the original sound, or that all the sounds are original sounds, but then the writing is layered onto it. And uh, I wonder whether you know something about the editing process and, and when and where the writing came in. No, and I'm, I mean, when, whenever I saw it many times and I was always wondering when did she decide that it's a film? Um, because uh, you know, even, even in, the, um, in these monologues or diary entries um, that, that I believe were written after the fact, so... Um, 
she keeps kind of like this of all um this of all the idea that this is a film and and you know the idea that there was a notebook full of notes that she forget or lost or that doesn't care about or want to get rid of um is really interesting um also i mean the People who were in touch with Ackerman while she was in Israel from the university said that she um, denied the fact that she's making a film. She said, "I'm not going to make a film about Israel." Um, and in a way, it's a non-film, because at, I think at, at this point, to make, what, what does it mean to make a film about Israel? Does it mean to have answers or to be able to make a statement about a situation that at that point was very conflicted or very puzzling? Um, I, I mean, if this is to make a film about Israel, then Ackerman never made a film about Israel, right? She, she doesn't make any, she's, in, she's incapable of making any statements. I mean, as she herself would say, um, also in many interviews after the film. So, I, I mean, it's a good question, when, when was it decided that this is a film? Um, Yeah, it, there's, there's something of a lost and found uh, film in there because the, the, the notebook that she loses contains a film and she loses it at the movies, uh, which of course is, a, is an interesting claim or story to tell. And this seems like a film that she found along the way that, that in a way emerged. It's interesting because, you know, when she talks about uh, no home movie, she says... Um, If I knew when I was shooting it that I'm making a film, I would never make it because uh, it was too personal and too scary for me to make it. And I think that there is something, I mean, it's not by chance that I decided to open with no home movie because for me, these two films really, um, yeah, are really connected. And I mean, yes, please, Fina. Thank you very much for your very captivating talk. Um, I was very taken with the way that you kept coming back to the geography of it and saying like, so this happened like a 15 minute walk from where Ackerman was staying. Um, and for me that really was sort of drawing out the relationality um, and maybe almost intertextuality of those different films. Um, and now that you, when you were stressing that this was almost sort of Um, a phase in Israeli filmmaking where there was this turn to kind of go back or turn inwards to domestic spaces. Um, and I was wondering, because once again, it's Ackerman sort of coming in from the outside, not being an Israeli filmmaker herself, um, but doing the same thing. Um, so I was wondering, do you feel like this is something that happens more just out of her situation or is it also a very semi-conscious reference to that is it a kind of conversation with that is it maybe part of why or is it connected to this question of when did this become a film that that this was also happening elsewhere and then I guess I also I'm not really aware of the timelines of when these films came out I mean, it's interesting because there was the, um, like the last part that wasn't very developed about all these visits and people who came to Israel in order to make a film and, and wanted to make a statement. So they were out there. Like Susan Zontag, I mean, she moved from one space to the other. Um, I, I, I showed um, two slides from this film. It's, it's really horrifying. I mean, that's the most horrifying sequence. Uh, she goes to the Sinai Desert where the war uh, was roaring uh, just um, a few months ago. Uh, but but her, her, her portrayal of Israel is really jarring. Um, and, and the same goes for Chris Moore. I mean, it's all about location. Um, so it's really interesting. It's like, you know, it's this visit as a way to capture something uh, while Ackerman doesn't try to do it. I think it's related, first of all, to the tradition of the avant-garde. And as I said, you know, Per Love um, is very much attached to the same tradition and is familiar with the same authors. Um, and Per Love is a very prominent figure in the... I mean, when he starts doing diary, he's kind of like being expelled, but then... But then he started teaching at Tel Aviv University, so the other filmmakers that I showed were kind of his students or his colleagues. Um, so his view from a window is a, is a very strong reference. 
Um, for Ackerman, it's something else. I think it's her relations towards domesticity in all of her film. I do need to say that she's very well known in Israel and very admired, um, and was invited again and again. Uh, so th there is a relationship there, um, which just didn't just start it in 2003. Um, I think her aesthetic of the home is a bit different than the aesthetic of the Israeli authors because they know that they need to go out. Um, and there is also kind of like, you know, they look outside the window, but I mean, they look outside. She really looks inside. Um, I hope it kind of like answered your question. Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could say something about this one sequence, um, almost uh, towards the end of the film, where we suddenly have this movement and these yeah. night shots, because that's so different from the rest of yeah. the film. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that, since you've I mean, have been thinking about the film so much. Yeah, I, 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 do you have? Because it, it takes me by surprise every time. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, did this happen last time I saw the film? Um, the, yeah, I shared the same impression. I had seen the film in preparation to tonight, and tonight I was like, oh, did something go wrong with the copy now? Like, <laughs> this, is not, this is not in the film, is it? And I had seen it before, and it just it strikes me every time that it's so different suddenly. We are so used to the uh, pace of the, the static shots and the, the timing and everything, and then suddenly you have this, I don't know, this alien in the middle of the film. Um, mm. But I still don't know what to make of it, I have to admit. But but it's interesting because, I mean, there is something with the sun, right? Um, which, by the way, is a mark of, of um, Israeli light. Like the, the frames are always kind of burned. I remember when I um, went to Tel Aviv University and did like the whatever, intro to video or something. Um, um the 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 class instructor told us to go and shoot in the winter not the summer because then you know all your all your frames will be burned um and then all of a sudden we have this night sequence right that's the only time in which this, the, there isn't this kind of like very very strong um daylight um and the night there is something very soothing about the tel aviv night but here it's like it's very it's really demonizing the city, right? All of a sudden, it, it does have like this character, and you know, it looks like a demon. Yeah. The only thing I could think of is, uh, I think it was also Alisa Libo last, last time, or I don't remember, who said, the thing with Ackerman is that whenever you think you got yeah. it, she does something else. So that was for me this moment, ah, okay, when I thought the whole film was going to be like that, you have something that changes the... There is no method, there is no structure that she really sticks to, and that's... She's never formulaic, never. Uh, which is what the title of our series means. Mm -hmm. She's, she has an incredible power for invention. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that takes me by surprise was the sequence is also the, the way the camera moves. Which, I mean, also I'm thinking about her other films, it's, um, it's unique. Yes, please, Hannah. Um, I just wanted to comment on your question because for me, it really connect that scene really connected to one of the sentences that she kept repeating, which was, um, "You can be happy that you sleep" or something like this, I think. And if that's the way she perceives the nights, and of course she can be happy that she sleeps. No, I don't know. I was I was actually thinking about the, the the topic of sleep because there are two scenes or that in the dialogue or in the monologue or in the commentary where where it really matters. The first one, early on in the film, where she uh, describes her moment of illness, and she goes out and, and then goes back to the apartment and falls asleep, and it's a sort of a relief, but it's also ambiguous. And then the two suicides of the two women. Uh, or in, she introduces them by saying they couldn't sleep anymore, and then they killed themselves. Um, so, I mean, those are the two instances where sleep is explicitly referred to, and I think it's a key motive of the whole argument of the film. 
And also the suicide bombing happen, happened when she... While she of, sleeps, yes. While she sleeps. Yes, absolutely. And it's strange that she didn't wake up because it's very close to her. And it's... it's I mean, well, the noise of the of the bombing itself, but also all the police and ambulances afterwards, I would assume that that was a really, really messy and noisy night. Do we have any more comments or questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the for the great talk. Um, it just a similar question as Laura had. Um, the scenes at the seaside because these are the only ones. I mean, she visits only when she goes out. She's at the seaside, and I didn't quite know what to make out of them. I mean, it's a very um, cliche image of. The horizon and um, it's to look like to some place else, but I think this is too too flat of an in, uh, of an interpretation. <laughs> and so I ask for your your opinion on that. Um, I can say what the what the I mean. There is something with the I mean historically, but also personally for me, something with the sea that I think is maybe is like what Ackerman is doing here. First of all, Tel Aviv is on the beach, like. A, huge section of it is on the beach no i mean but it, it when it was originally built um um the city planners did not perceive it as as a as a beach city actually they were planning to build like an entire industrial area that separates the city from the beach because they wanted a city that is a cultural capital they came from europe they didn't know what to do with the sea um so th there is this kind of like and the sea was discovered much later uh, as part of the city but in a way, Tel Aviv is such a crowded, and I, I don't know if you got this, but a very noisy city. Like there is constantly noise of construction, and and and, and me and a friend of mine who also lived in Tel Aviv were joking that oh, it, I mean because we we associated with you know what happened in the city in the last decade, where in which it became this kind of like real estate monster. Uh, but no, it was always there. Like it's always a city under construction. Um, and and so in a way, and this is where I mean my personal interpretation: you go to the beach to escape from the city. Um, the the beach is a place where you know this kind of like claustrophobic, noisy, hectic, but also very vibrant uh, atmosphere kind of like fades away, and 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 you can actually have like, especially in the in the early spring before it's hot, you can actually have a moment. Of solitude, um, so it's really interesting when she goes out. She doesn't engage with the city. She turns her back and go like it, literally four minutes um, to 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 this kind of like empty space. Uh, it's also a space that is not marked by Tel Avivians necessarily. Everybody goes to the beach. Um, it's it's so it's really um, it's not well you know the city itself is very like. There are certain crowds in certain places. The beach is where everyone is. So, yeah. It's the only uh, shot where we have a full body view of her. Is this her? What I the think woman it that is we her. see? I was also, I mean, I keep changing my mind. Yeah. Because it feels to me counter, well, as we said, you know, she always surprises you. But it feels to me counterintuitive that she would stand like <laughs> this. Um, uh, also, I'm thinking about you know who's taking care of the camera, but um, but um, yeah. She asked somebody to do it for her. Uh, I don't know. I, I was, uh, but it's interesting. I was absolutely certain that it's her because of the the, the height and and the the, atti the attitude, the, the, the tenure. Uh, pretty sure it's her, but it matters whether yeah. or not it's her. Obviously, I mean we got we got sort of parts of her head in some of the shots. And we see her reflection when she brushes her teeth true. in the in the um, I like the moments where her like top of the head entering the frame. Mm. Uh, there is something almost uh, deliberately sloppy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I was talking to Laura when we um, test the um, the film and she said that it was really hard for them to get a good copy and I said well there is no good copy. She shot the entire film with a crappy DV camera. Um, and so for me, it's interesting how she, like, on the one hand, these frames are so 
well framed uh, and the camera, you can see that she was really thinking where to position them and the editing is so accurate, but at the same time there is something messy and something that kind of like sabotage or undermine itself. Which is perfectly in tune with what the film is all about. Yeah, yeah. It would have, it would have been completely off if it had been any more perfect than this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. Don't have any more questions. Let's thank Lolly again and uh